Hello everybody. I am Dr. Sneha Patel from MB Patel English Medium Secondary and Higher Secondary School. Students of 11th Standard, let us study English. Today we shall deal with chapter number 2 from the book Hornbill. The title of the chapter is, We are not afraid to die if we can all be together. And this chapter is written by Gordon Cook and Alan East. Let us first know about the characters of the story. There is a family of four. Narrator is a 37-year-old businessman. His wife is Mary. Jonathan is his son who is six-year-old. And Susan is the daughter who is seven-year-old. Larry Vigil from America and Herb Siegler from Switzerland are the crewmen. The story is about adventure, about human ambition and competence, family bonding, a thrilling story. The narrator was impressed with the adventure taken by Captain James Cook approximately 200 years ago. Captain James Cook voyaged, traveled through water around the world. Narrator and his wife had this fascination of traveling around the world through the sea route. For making their dream come true, they practiced religiously and meticulously in the British waters as they belonged to Britain. In this way, they sharpened their seafaring skills, skills which are required to travel through various water bodies. Wave Walker was the name of the boat in which the characters traveled. It was a 23 meter, 30 ton wooden hulled boat. It was professionally built. They had practiced on it and tested it in the roughest weather. And after passing the test, they actually traveled in the wave walker. Students, while reading the chapter, you will come across the names of various parts of the boat. It is very much necessary for us to understand the parts as they are mentioned quite frequently in the chapter. And for the better understanding, let us look at it. It's important to be familiar with the vocabulary that is unique to sailing. Let's begin by learning some of the names of important parts of a boat. The hull is the body of the boat that floats in the water. The front of the hull is called the bow. The back of the hull is called the stern. The keel is the weighted fin at the bottom of the boat. Its weight gives it stability, reducing tipping or heeling, while its shape keeps the boat from sliding sideways. The rudder, which is controlled by the tiller, is the foil that is used to steer the boat. The deck is the top of the hull. The cockpit is the low space in the deck where the crew sits. The companionway is the opening to the cabin. The tiller attached to the rudder moves side to side to steer the boat. When looking forward, the right side of the boat is starboard, the left is port. Narrator and his wife had planned the journey for three years. It was to be a 105,000 kilometer journey through the various water bodies. This was their route. They begin from Plymouth, England. Then they reached Cape Town in Africa. They also traveled through the Indian Ocean and reached the Lee Amsterdam, it is in South Indian Ocean. And then they got back home. Here in the map, we can observe the route that was undertaken by the characters. The family members, the family consisting of four members, narrator, his wife and two children. They started from Plymouth, England and they journeyed happily 
to South Africa. They reached Cape Town in South Africa. From there, they were joined by two experts, Larry from America and Herb from Switzerland. They were there to help them, the family, face the challenges during their journey. When they, the next destination was Australia. But when they were traveling in the Indian Ocean, they faced lot many difficulties. Their boat also was struck by huge waves and they had to break their journey here in Lee, Amsterdam. How and why? Let us see. In 1976 of July, the narrator and his family, wife Mary, daughter Suzanne and son Jonathan started their journey from Plymouth, England. The journey passed pleasantly as they sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town. From Cape Town, two crewmen, American Larry Vigil and Swiss Herb Segler joined them to help them deal with the world's toughest seas, the Southern Indian Ocean. On the second day out of Cape Town, they began to encounter strong gales. The strong winds blew continuously for the next few weeks, but the narrator was not worried about the wind. He was tensed with the alarming size of the waves, which rose to 15 meters as high as the mast of their boat. Despite the frightful weather, they celebrated Christmas and New Year's Day cheerfully. But there was no improvement in the weather. In fact, it became worse. At the dawn of January 2nd, the waves were gigantic. As the ship rose to the top of each wave, they could see the endless, enormous seas rolling towards them. As you can observe, their experience was really frightful. As the condition worsened, all the members on the boat went through the life raft drill, attached lifeliners, wore oilskins and life jackets, and waited. They were prepared to face the worst. The first indication of impending disaster came at about 6 p.m with an ominous silence. The boat was struck by a huge and thunderous wave. The tremendous explosion of the wave shook the deck. A torrent of green and white water broke over the ship. The narrator's head smashed into the wheel and he went sinking below the waves. He expected his approaching death and was losing consciousness. He felt peaceful. Unexpectedly, the narrator's head popped out of the water and he could see the wave walker nearby. The boat was severely damaged. Anyhow, he swam towards the boat and was able to get back on the deck. His left ribs cracked his mouth was filled with blood and had broken teeth. Somehow, he found the wheel and lined up the stern for the next wave and hung on. There was water everywhere. The narrator was sure there that the ship had water below, but he did not leave the wheel to investigate. His wife Mary came up to him and told him that the deck was smashed 
and the boat was full of water. He gave the control of will to Mary and went to help Larry and Herb in pumping out the water of boat. The narrator went first directly to his children to check whether they were all right or not. His daughter Susan, pointing to a big bump over her eyes, said that she was hurt there. The narrator could not attend to the injury as he had to make repairs on the boat. After finding a hammer, screws and canvas, the narrator went back on the deck. He managed to stretch canvas and secure waterproof hatch covers across the gapping holes. In this way, he was able to keep some water out of the boat when each wave struck the boat. They faced another problem. Both the hand pumps and one electric pump stopped working so they could not drain water off the boat. But thankfully, they had another electric pump which helped them a little. In the bitter cold, they struggled the whole night, pumping, steering and working the radio. They did not get any reply to their emergency calls because of the stormy weather. Sue, who already had injured her head and had two big black eyes, showed a deep cut on her arm. When she was asked why she did not show that injury before, the reply that she gave was heart melting. She told her father that she did not want to worry him when he was trying to save all of them. By morning on January 3rd, the pumps had the water level sufficiently under control for them to take rest in rotation. But still, many repair, repairs were to be done on the boat. They had survived for 15 hours since the wave hit, but the wave walker wouldn't hold together long enough for them to reach Australia. He checked the charts and calculated that there were two small islands a few hundred kilometers to the east. One of them, Lee Amsterdam, was closer than the other. On January 4th, after 36 hours of continuous pumping, only few centimeters of water remained on the boat. They had now to keep pace with the water still coming in. Mary found some corn beef and cracker biscuits and they had their first meal in almost two days. Despite all the negativity going around, the children were very optimistic. When the narrator's son asked him if they were going to die, the narrator replied that they could survive. At that time, Jonathan said that both the children were not afraid of dying if they all could be together. The family, narrator, Mary, Sue and Jonathan. This positivity of his children encouraged the narrator to give his best and make every attempt to save his family. That evening, the narrator and his wife sat together holding hands as the motion of the ship brought more and more water in through the broken planks. They both felt the end was near. By the morning of January 6, Wave Walker rode out the storm and the winds eased. When the narrator was thinking about the ways to reach the island hopelessly, his daughter went up to him with her swollen head and blackened eyes. She gave a card that she had prepared to her father. She had drawn the caricatures of her father and mother and wrote a message inside. She wrote that she loved them both. 
she had prepared that card to say thank you to them and encouraged them to hope for the best. The narrator was again motivated to not give up. He went on the deck and asked Larry to steer a course of 185 degree so they could expect to see the island at about 5 p.m. He went on his bunk and slept off as he was very tired. When he woke up at 6 p.m., he felt that they had missed the island. The narrator was very tensed at the thought of having missed the island. He knew that the boat was severely damaged and it required repairs because it could not sustain the journey till Australia. And that is why reaching that little island was very important for them. When the narrator was feeling hopeless and sad, his children went up to his bunk and his son asked him to give him a hug. When the narrator asked him why he was given a hug at that time, Jonathan replied that because he was the best daddy in the whole world. At this, the narrator was not so very convinced because he was stressed. But then his daughter told him, his daughter Sue told him that they were happy as their daddy found the island. At this, the narrator along with his children rushed on the deck and was relieved to look at the outline of Lee Amsterdam. It was only a bleak piece of volcanic rock with little vegetation, but still, it was the most beautiful island in the world for them. It was a ray of hope. For them, that island meant survival. The next morning, 28 inhabitants of the island helped the crew ashore. With the land under his feet again, the narrator's thoughts were full of Larry and Herb, cheerful and optimistic Mary, who stayed at the will for all crucial hours. The narrator was extremely happy with the courage shown by his seven-year-old daughter and six-year-old son who were not afraid because they trusted their parents wholeheartedly. The title of the story, We Are Not Afraid to Die If We All Can Be Together, is truly justified, especially in the attitude shown by the children, in the attempts of the elders of surviving. They did not give up hope. And finally, they were rescued. They were saved. You will come across some idioms and phrases in this chapter, which are honing our seafaring skills. It means the efforts put by the author and his wife to perfect or sharpen their seafaring skills needed to travel by water. Pinpricks in the vast ocean. This phrase expresses the insignificance of two small islands in the vast ocean. Ominous silence. The silence here refers to an impending danger. Mayday calls. An internationally recognized distress signal via radio telephone made during an emergency. A tousled head means disarranged hair. Please go through these idioms and phrases. Learn them. One of the most beautiful things about learning English is that it teaches us the values in life. Let us see what we learned from this chapter. Children in the story are shown courageous and grateful in their attitude, 
as they have complete trust in their parents and believe that they will not let anything wrong happen to them. Trust your parents. Develop expertise in the field of your choice. Intelligence, competence, training, perseverance and experience in that field would sustain and cheer you. When faced with danger, be optimistic. Have faith in your abilities. Hazardous experiences bring out the best in us. We must react to danger and risk with patience and fortitude, with all our strength and vigor. Be positive. Human is adventurous by nature. Greater the risk, more the thrill. The thrill of exploring the unknown encourages a person to venture away from the comfort zone and be well prepared to overcome difficulties and danger. Take calculated risks. Invest your time and energy in family bonding and true friendship. Family and friends make life worth living. Give importance to family and friends. Students, I hope you understood the story of this chapter. But the main thing still remains. You have to read the story. Watch this video again for better understanding. Write the question answers. Study well. Take care of yourself. Thank you so much.